Okay, very good morning to you. It is Wednesday the 29th of July. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, Going to run you through some of the morning's headlines and kicking things off straight away with the general sentiment here at the European Open. It's just around 7am now here in London. And we've got a little bit of a pullback in the dollar after what was the dollar index snapping a, a seven day losing streak yesterday and moving a little bit higher. Uh, the Dixie has actually backed down about one tenth of 1% this morning and retesting about the lows in the Dixie of where we were trading um, about midday yesterday. So worth keeping an eye on. Uh, any further extension, of course, of that overall trend we've seen of late of dollar weakness going into, of course, the Fed tonight could well help then underpin support for these major currency pairs. So euro dollar and cable up a touch, about 15 pips each respectively here in the top left hand corner of my charts. Uh, so euro just coming up and close to testing here uh, around the high points that we were seeing from the session midday yesterday and also you can see that was a support point as well from late on Monday session so worth keeping an eye here on the euro uh, any further extension then you've got the R1 just above uh, and then the weekly highs would be residing just below that 118 level uh, in cable as well similar type of price movement the overnight Asia Pacific high uh, would be the first line of potential resistance. You can see here uh, if we continue to see an extension of some dollar weakness. Uh, so 129.42 in the futures and then the high that was seen yesterday evening wouldn't be too far away, about another 15 pips or so from current price action. Um, equity index futures, US pretty flat overall, minor positives in the NASDAQ and, and basically unchanged in the S&P. The DAX though a little soft. We'll have a look, a couple of earnings reports, particularly BASF uh, are seen down um, pre-market after their earnings report. We'll have a look at those in a moment. Uh, otherwise, elsewhere, T-notes are unchanged, very quiet price activity, absolutely sideways in the overnight session. Pretty minimal reaction seen in WTI crude to the API numbers we had last night, but we'll recap those numbers in a, in a moment. And then gold, we'll get that chart up again and look at that in a bit more detail a few things to talk about obviously a big uh, bout of profit taking i would say more than anything else given the momentum move that we've seen occur in gold um, kind of capitulate almost on the breakthrough of those all-time highs in the last 48 hours or so but we're almost right back into that trend moving higher again this morning up another eight nine dollars uh, having reclaimed back to around a 1950 handle now having dropped down to around 1900 yesterday. So that's the general um, theme of things at the moment. One thing I'll say right now is do not forget to um, join us later on this evening. Myself and the team are going to be covering the FOMC live. So all you need to do is just like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit that bell icon uh, and then you'll get a notification as soon as we go live. We'll go live about half an hour before the actual Fed announcement in good time then that me and the team can run you through exactly how we're going to cover it, how we're going to trade it uh, and then we'll do the whole uh, announcement in real time and share everything with you. So hopefully you can join us then. Uh, but let's just run through some of the headlines. What have we got? Now interestingly yesterday a uh, couple of things that were coming out. Um, obviously you had earning seasons really uh, picked up pace this week and you had a couple of big Dow components yesterday disappoint so worse than expected results and the likes of uh, McDonald's uh, 3M you know these are sizable companies and there's more earnings reports of course to come and the real big day comes on Thursday after market when you get those mega cap tech names um, but a couple of other things as well we've had the index of consumer confidence we had yesterday uh, obviously dropped significantly on the onset of the pandemic but if you think about where we were generally with this very strong v-shaped recovery we've had in market prices people were kind of quite positive by what we were seeing with these big out performances in economic data you remember about a month ago i was commenting quite frequently on the citigroup surprise index and we were always outperforming it's kind of the natural way of which human psychology tends to work is that when we're very depressed, we're very depressed. And so therefore the numbers come in and it was quite an easy kind of beat almost because we were so down in the doldrums on the back of the severity of the, the health um, pandemic situation. Uh, so now though, things have started to change as the economy has, has, well, as markets have stabilized 
and we've rebounded so sharply. The bar has got kind of ever higher now for for expectations to be achieved, and we started to see a couple of misses accumulate. And in the index of consumer confidence was no different yesterday, coming in at 92.6. That's a fairly, I mean, I know it. it's hard to look at it in context of just a sharp drop that we had um, with the pandemic, but don't forget we were at all time highs here in this particular piece of data. Uh, but a drop from 92.6 from 98.3 is pretty sizable. Uh, and it was below, of course, expectations of, of 95 as well. So largely a reflection, of course, of obviously what's been happening in North America over the last four to six weeks, which is going to be really key for the Fed, of course, is this whole development around the second phase, if you like, of the global um, COVID situation, particularly in North America, where, if anything, it's got materially worse uh, over that period of time, and that's obviously dented and fed through into um, lowering of consumer confidence. The other thing then is what we had last night, and there was some news out from the Fed. They've almost front run a little portion, if you like, of what we're going to hear probably later on tonight. And they have gone ahead, and basically they've extended most of its emergency lending programs by a period of three months. That will take it through then to the end of the year, the remainder of this year. Uh, the extension applies to um, seven programs. Uh, the municipal liquidity facility, that was already set to expire at the end of the year. The commercial paper funding facility was due to end uh, in March of 2021. Um, but to give you some context, there, there's about 11 emergency facilities ongoing at the moment. Here's just a, a kind of overview of a couple of the main ones. Uh, and as you can see, the blue lines here with the black line. The black line actually indicates then uh, the amount of usage that that facility has actually had. So the only one that's seen any degree of significant usage has been the Paycheck Protection Program Liquidity, the PPPLF. Uh, but you can see even that has only been used to a fraction of actually the amount of which it has uh, signed off capacity for. Uh, so the idea here, it's almost like the Fed, in my mind, um, are conscious of the fact that we're at a bit of a tipping point here where things have, if anything, um, got materially worse on probably one of the most fundamental risks to the economy, that being COVID. And we're likely to hear a somewhat then reflected in a dovish tone from the Fed generally tonight, more repetition of that will do whatever it takes to support the economy type vibe. But to me, this extension is kind of like the, the arm over the markets. It's like, look, all these facilities are here. I'm just reminding you, I got your back. Don't worry, things might get worse. As we go into the winter, you know, as, as things develop, uh, but it's okay because we're gonna extend this out. And you know, whether there's a fiscal package, we're pushing for that. Whether there's not, we're here to support the market. Um, so I think the Fed have always you know, no one can say that the Fed uh, have not um, have have under delivered. They've over delivered in almost every single step that they've taken. You know, they were the first to to take the emergency into meeting cut to rates globally. They were the first to deploy a lot of these different programs, and these programs cumulatively account for trillions of dollars worth uh, of potential support to the economy, of which has only been used to a fraction. So I think this is quite a, um, yes, there's a, there's a function to what they've done by extending a lot of these emergency programs, but don't forget, hardly any of them have really been used. So this to me is more of a tactical move to deploy now in order to alleviate any forthcoming tensions, which don't really exist right now, but it's to offset it in the future, just to remind the markets that look, we're here, uh, as I said. So I think a, a good move by the Fed and uh, one that certainly uh, we'll be looking out for more information when Powell speaks, of course, uh, in the follow-up to the statement from the Fed later on tonight. And on that point, you know, what are we expecting from the FOMC? Well, as I said, uh, we're going to cover this all live. So all you need to do, as I said, subscribe to the channel. Um, just hit that bell icon and, and you'll know as soon as we go live. Um, we're going to go over things in full, but to give you a general overview of generally what people are talking about, I mean, the markets for one uh, are, as I said, functioning relatively well at this point in time. Uh, longer dated yields remaining at such low levels 
uh, the Fed has little need really to alter too much its language or stance at this time. There's a lot of things that people are looking at, any tweaks to the balance sheet, this idea of yield curve control, this idea about their inflation kind of monetary targeting or forward guidance. But the things I've read would indicate that most people on the street are looking at that any of these types of changes, if happening at all in the future, are more likely to happen when we get back into September. Uh, because at the moment, it's one of those things, isn't it, where as long as everything is okay, is there much need to keep offering more and more substantial policy um, changes? You really want to keep that ammunition back to deploy it later on when then things, if they materially change, you've got an ability to adapt and help support the market further. If you fire off your bullets now and things do materially worsen over the period of the next two, three, four months as we go into the autumn, then then where do you go? So I think that the, the Fed's um, move to extend the emergency lending programs um, was that to a certain degree, but a soft kind of level of that. Remember, these are more mechanical, more functional for liquidity in the system. What the uh, the, po the monetary policy changes is a different, different side of things. Uh, and that, I don't think that they'll want to do anything more. And I don't think they should do anything more just yet. So a few, few points here. Um, the committee will discuss changes to its forward guidance for interest rates and asset purchases, as well as framework for monetary policy decisions. So they'll discuss it, but it's likelihood then that any final decisions of any potential changes will not come, most people are thinking, until September. Um, Powell likely to reinforce his message. The usual kind of rhetoric will do whatever it takes. We'll use a full range of tools, repeating a call for fiscal aid from Congress, putting the pressure on for the politicians, particularly sensitive right now, given the looming expirations of several of those programs we've been discussing this week on Friday. Um, since the last meeting, obviously the COVID situation, as I have as mentioned, has got worse and perhaps even more uncertain. So it'd be really interested to see what their updates are on that point. And on balance then, does that open up, if anything, uh, reasons to be even a little bit more downbeat in your assessment of overall things? And if so, um, that probably explains already some of the dollar weakness and the yield movement that we've had. But does that extend again when we get confirmation of that later on tonight will be interesting. Um, the Fed has discussed linking its rate path to reaching or, importantly, overshooting its 2% inflation goal, goal or to an unemployment rate objective. Um, a lot They've been talking about this, particularly about refining their forward guidance kind of technique. Um, the idea then that they could allow inflation to overshoot and that wouldn't then require them to what is currently the process to start lifting rates that in itself then has been one of the reasons it's been pressuring yields even lower because the Fed might well be more open to flexibility on that inflation target, which if anything then means that there's a way higher bar then if they're to raise interest rates in the future, meaning that they're unlikely to do it for an incredibly long period of time. Um, so uh, the Bloomberg survey though of economists has suggested that nothing on that is likely to materialize um, until September. Um, and then Fed officials have repeatedly suggested they are not close to targeting rates on Treasury. So this is that framework which would come under the kind of title of, of yield control that we've seen adopted elsewhere and by us, some of the other central banks like the Bank of Japan. Powell in June said that they were studying it and it was an early stage thing. But again, the latest Bloomberg Economist survey suggests now that no one expects that to happen, yield curve control. Um, at all to be adopt adopted. Um, so yeah, a couple things there. Uh, as I said, I'll be there to kind of guide you through. Um, I'll recap a lot of these things uh, later on tonight when we talk about it in more detail. Um, interestingly then, uh, as I just said, yields have been declining. The US five-year real yield uh, and the gold price have, have, have basically been um, seeing a, a clear divergence here. And that's been one of the underlying uh, kind of reasonings why the gold market has been you know so on fire of late uh, and on that note let's just have a look at the gold charts because certainly you know for any new traders it's it, it's so tempting obviously to 
to get involved in an asset that's showing such phenomenal movement. Um, but the, the problem that you have then is that the, an asset, when it starts breaking all-time highs, like what we saw in this period here, starts to trade then quite from a behavioral point of view. Um, and that being on the notion that there's no really historical technical reference point. And so you get a lot of this momentum move, and particularly in a product like gold, you get these big flushes of price movement. Uh, and yesterday then, um, what we had was after that massive big push up, um, what I can just encapsulate into nothing other than really profit taking. Uh, and at that point then, I mean, we already had these, these are the two rectangles we had marked up from, from yesterday's briefing. And we were looking at really two key areas, and one was that, that trend line, which obviously got broken through, but that was the pivot in yesterday's price session and also those respective lows here. So that was a key level, and you can see then how the market reacted here. Uh, and this is why the technicals are so important when an asset's moving in, in a kind of a momentum-based situation, because it acts as a trigger point then for the uh, secondary flush in price. And so here then, after we came back, you can see we bounced very aggressively, first of all, off that exact technical level that we were looking at, and then broke through right into those areas where we were kind of looking at these highs here, which was um, then the 1900 level. And it, and it basically, in the futures at least, it bounced all the way, literally to the tick, to 1900. And this is very common then of that, again, that momentum ignition kind of move where people were targeting key technicals and key psychological levels and very evident yesterday with that 1900 being targeted then almost immediately bouncing straight back up 25 bucks and then again that pivot floor um, seen late yesterday afternoon and we pushed all the way back up in the overnight Asia Pacific session north of 1950 where we trade again today so here uh, near term price levels um, of significance obviously that overnight Asia high will be key uh, I definitely think we should also mark up higher levels, such as the all-time new high, which we printed uh, yesterday's Asia session, so 1974. Um, then here on the downside, the pivot at 1941-42 is actually quite a nice level uh, on the downside. Now, again, you've got to be familiar or, or just aware of the the ability though if you're if you're nursing these trades you've got to keep it relatively tight because if you get on the wrong side obviously you can see quite a big snap lower and uh, so you want to have the ability to just get stopped out on that trade if then it doesn't respond to that long positioning playing that uh, range kind of low to get back long again um, on the downside if we start triggering back down lower again well then I'd be looking uh, basically here and then that previous low again so the key three areas of support I would see in an intraday basis for gold would be down here at 41s, then that 25 again, and then down at that sort of 1900 to 1904 type uh, zone uh, would be quite key. Now on the gold front, a couple of different things here I want to mention. Um, I did put out a poll last night on Twitter. I'm always interested to to see where your guys' heads are at. We've got about 400 votes here, so a decent amount, uh, relatively small though sample size, but um, I put out the question, where do people think gold will be by year end? Uh, sub 1500, 1500 to 2000, 2000 to 2500, or above 2500. And you can see here, the, the highest most popular call for the year-end price for gold is to be sat between 2000 and 2500 again higher than where we are today and of course breaching that psychological 2000 uh, level now on this point will and i had a conversation about gold yesterday morning i did share that on our youtube channel uh, so do check that out uh, good conversation with him because he's always you know, gold's probably his most favoured product to trade and he's been in it over the course of the last few years uh, and he has got uh, some, a nice interesting perspective really looking at how um, history has repeated itself in previous occasions 
Uh, we were looking back at when we initially hit the 1000 marker and then how the price activity was responding around those levels and when it breached, how quickly it ran up to 1250 and then 1250 to 1500 and 1500 up to 1920, which was the previous high. So there's definitely some, some lessons out of historical price movement and also his calls for why 2500 in gold yeah, is not an unrealistic target under these types of conditions that we're witnessing at the moment. So yeah, check that out, uh, that video, good conversation. Elsewhere then, uh, from an earnings perspective, some things that we do have um, today, pre-market, the ones you need to really be aware of from the States, is gonna be Boeing, General Electric, uh, and then after market, you've got Facebook, so one of the big tech names before the other big guns come out tomorrow. Um, on the European side of things, um, Deutsche Bank, you can see in pre-market here, are up about 2.6%. Uh, their Q2 net revenue is 6.3 billion, above the expected 5.94. Their FIC trading revenues um, above expectations. They said they have strong capital position, providing scope for growth. Uh, revenues anticip anticipated to be essentially flat for the year versus previous view of slightly lower. So actually, uh, on the balance of things, quite positive update from Deutsche. And their shares are up about 2.6% ahead of cash open shortly. Uh, BASF, though, one of the other big, uh, large weighted companies in the DAX, they're on the right on the other end of the table. They're down about an equal amount to how much Deutsche are up. So they're down about 2.5%. Uh, their sales came in below expectations at 12.68 billion. They said negatively impacted by slightly lower price level. Um, their adjusted EBIT came in basically in line with expectations. They said they cannot provide a full year guidance, uh, does not expect EBIT before special items to improve significantly uh, versus their previous um, given seasonality effects as well. So a uh, bit of a mixed bag there, uh, BASF down, about two and a half, but you can see Deutsche still adding to some pre-market movement at the moment, up about 3%. Then in the oil market, uh, I don't think it's necessary for me to really get the price up. There wasn't really too much reaction to this information last night, but again, it acts as our reference point for the DOEs later on. Um, the crude figure in the API last night was a draw of 6.829 million, which was quite large comparative to expectations of a draw of just 1.2. Cushing though, um, was a build, as was gasoline, both to the tune of around 1.1 million, distillers was a build of about 187,000. Looking at the calendar for today, um, it is actually quite quiet. Um, mortgage approval data coming out of the UK is not really a market mover as far as sterling is concerned. Um, then we're going to the US afternoon, you do have pending homes uh, sales. You've also got the advanced goods trades balance number coming out of the US and then the all infantry numbers in the DOE. And then the tension though, the main event will be the Fed. So perhaps worth keeping that in mind. Uh, if the calendar is quite light, um, Xing out any potential kind of Trump rhetoric on China and um, you know, barring no unsurprising comments from there, um, it could well be that the market respects its relative near ranges and then we just kind of lead into the Fed uh, and then the market will take its cue from what's said there for later on for then to dictate then some of the price movement through Thursday until we get those big mega cap earnings come out at the end of that day on Thursday. Um, the other final point is keep an eye on Capitol Hill. Um, they still really haven't signed conclusively this deal yet. Uh, the latest is that the one trillion pandemic relief package um, that's been proposed by the Senate Republicans that we were talking about yesterday has been met with very intense resistance from the Democrats. They're particularly unhappy with cutting the enhanced uh, un or unemployment benefits from $600 to $200. The actual plan in itself has also re re reportedly caused deep divisions within the Senate Republicans themselves about their own relief package. So still quite a lot to play for here, and that does carry an inherent risk to markets if they can't come to some overall compromise and conclusion to push this thing forward, because the deadline, of course, is on Friday for some of these programs. So keep an eye on that as well. All right, that is it from me. Going to wish you a good day, and hopefully I'll see you online later for the Fed. Take care.